you with a menu. <laughs> well, it's great to see uh, such a good crowd. Uh, I think we're going to get started 11 minutes early, um, just because there wouldn't be much point waiting for anyone else, because I don't think I can fit. Um, so yeah, the first tip is, if you put advanced and the word AngularJS in the title of any presentation, you, uh, you get a good crowd. So, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, for those of you that I've uh, not met, uh, my name's uh, Simon Guest. Um, I work at a company called uh, Nindetic. And I wanted to start today's session by, uh, by having my clicker not put in. <laughs> okay, I want to start the session by just touching on what the last decade of server-side HTML has looked like. So if we take a, just a regular app, the web app that we've been building over the last 10 years, it probably looks something like this. So you've got a, a server on the right here. That server is uh, doing some stuff. You've got a browser over here. And what happens? Well, the browser makes a request, as you all know, over HTTP for some kind of URL. You get some HTML generated here. Maybe there's some MVC going on. Maybe there's some Razor going on. And then some kind of response is returned in HTML. So hopefully that's not new to anyone. It's really well for us over the last decade. I think as, as we as we kind of look forward to the next decade, um, there are issues with that model. So number one, a lot, if not most of the UI actions require a round trip. So every time you do something, every time you press a button, every time you invoke a new page, typically you've got to do a round trip. And certainly on a lot of mobile uh, devices, that, that can be frustrating. Because you have a mobile device, and let's say you have a, a slowish connection. Well, I, I kind of hit the button, nothing happens. So I hit it again, and I hit it again, and eventually you get the page, and by which time I pressed it like four times. And, and when compared to, say, a, a, a native app, people, people get kind of frustrated. And thirdly, devices are getting much more powerful. So the device I have in my pocket isn't the browser that we used to use 10 years ago. Way much more powerful, it's probably got a quad core processor, bunch of RAM, bunch of this. It's, it's, it should be doing more than just sending a network request and, and getting an HTML back. Um, on the server side, our servers need to scale more. And if they're doing a lot of work processing HTML or doing MVC, that can be difficult. And then finally, any offline scenario tends to be tends to be near impossible. So taking a, a regular web a website today is uh, is, uh, is pretty tough. So I think what we need to do is, is look ahead to what the the next decade of client side JavaScript, uh, JavaScript or the next decade of, of web uh, web application programming. <laughs> you good? <laughs> All right, that's what we took Go in there. So what does the next decade look like? So one of the patterns I think we're seeing a lot of, and, and hopefully you've, you've seen this in the, in the room, is, is this one on the screen. So we still have the browser, still need one of those, we still have the server. And what happens is you make an initial HTTP request, so you've got to get the request going on, and then you get an initial page back, so HTML, but also you get a bunch of JavaScript. And what happens is that JavaScript is running locally in the browser here. And then that JavaScript is then responsible for the rest of the application. So functions and methods and all, a lot of logic that is running in the, uh, in the browser here is actually making the API calls and, and ultimately you're, you're functioning the application that way. So how does this help? Well, this kind of model means that a lot of the UI is brought down initially and therefore, a lot of the UI actions happen within the context of this, of this browser. So when I flip between pages, or when I click buttons, well, I don't need to do this round trip. Um, that, in turn, leads to a, a vastly improved uh, mobile experience. Um, so one, if I can flip using local JavaScript on the, on the device, well, things, things get, uh, uh, things get uh, feel a lot more smoother. Uh, and ultimately, we're, we're also taking advantage of the device as well. So we're, not just, we're actually doing stuff, we're actually moving a lot of the logic onto the device, which means the server can handle more clients. And ultimately, offline, I think, becomes a lot more manageable, manageable and doable. So 
The only issue, I guess, when we're thinking about moving to, to client-side JavaScript is there's just too many choices in terms of frameworks. So I don't know, uh, when you've seen, there's a site called uh, To Do MVC. Anyway, how many uh, people have come across this? A uh, few. So what To Do MVC is, is actually a really good site. It lists a lot of the popular uh, client-side frameworks. So things like Backbone, Angular, Ember, Knockout, many of the ones that you've done. And what they do is they implement a very simple to-do app on each of the frameworks. And the nice thing about this is uh, you, can kind of, you can kind of look at the, how the same app would work across different frameworks, and then you can kind of decide, okay, well, which, which, which framework is, uh, is for me. Um, and then I think as an industry, so I think to do NBC has probably about 50 different uh, frameworks today. Um, I think the, the, the space is much larger than that. I think as an industry, it's kind of coming down to probably four, if not two. So I think the four most popular ones are Knockout, Ember, Angular, and Backbone. And then I think what's happening is the industry is really navigating on two, um, Ember and Angular. And of course, this being a talk about Angular, that's of course the, probably the, the one that we, uh, we figure out today. I think there's any more people that will put on that box there. Yeah, let's keep the door closed and we'll sell all copies of the door okay. All right, close the door. I think some people can come down over here. All right. Uh, yeah, I think no, over here. Unless they're going to be kids walking across, I don't know how that's going to work. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to build on the uh, excitement of the Indian elections um, by uh, maybe doing a quick uh, audience poll, uh, just to set the scene for the, uh, the rest of the uh, topic and see which level we, uh, we need to be talking at. So uh, maybe a quick show of hands, who knows what AngularJS is? Okay, that's good, we've got the majority of the audience. Number two, who's just played around with the sample app on Angular? Okay, that's good, so uh, probably about two thirds of you. And then who is using Angular in some kind of ongoing project or some kind of production? Okay, so yeah, probably about quarter, quarter to a third. So that's good. That's, I was kind of fearful turning up. I'm like, okay, I'm putting this talk together. And then no one comes and they don't, they don't know what Angular is or everyone's doing it much better than I can. And, and I think we've we got somewhere in the middle. So one of the things that if you look at Angular, um, Angular has a lot of what are called kind of ups and downs. And uh, Ben Nadel, who's a popular blogger um, on many different frameworks, including Angular, um, put together this, uh, this diagram. And uh, maybe I'll zoom in for the, for the people at the back here. So he, this is a diagram that shows how you feel when you're using Angular. And it kind of starts off, it's like you, you kind of have that moment of, oh, this is pretty neat, yeah? And then you, you're kind of trying to work out, okay, how to do things. So it's like, well, wow, this is, this is so lame. Why would you do it this way? And then you kind of figure that out. It's like, ah, yeah, that's, that's actually pretty sweet. That's, that's the way you should do it. And then you, you try and do something else. It's, uh, it's like, uh, oops. Uh, it's, uh, I can't believe how difficult they are making some of this stuff. Are you kidding me? And then it kind of goes, and it's like, oh, and then you find out how to do it. It's like, oh, yeah, this is the right way to do it. That's how we should be doing it. Very cool. And uh, we've made a horrible choice. We should have went with Backbone. The project is doomed, doomed. And eventually you get to this, this, this kind of point of elation. But the, the, the point is that I think any Angular developer that has gone through or used it, either in production or, or kind of taking the samples, has gone through exactly that. You kind of go between this, this back and forth of, oh my god, that's really neat, to oh, I, I really just can't figure this stuff out. And one of the nice things about Angular is, and, and kind of speaks to this, is it does point you in the right direction it, it kind of guides you into the into the correct solution, um, even though it kind of takes you a, takes you a, potentially a while to get there. So the goal of the next uh, hour is to share. I put together ten tips and tricks on what we at Udesic have learned from real world Angular projects, and uh, kind of combine some of that with uh, tips and tricks from around the web. There's obviously a bunch of blog posts and articles and videos and and, and whatnot. Uh, my goal is to go, go through those 10 and uh, share as much code as possible. Um, so what I've done is I've taken the, the canonical to-do app and kind of extended it a bit, showing, uh, showing the model of things that we'll be, uh, we'll be covering today.
So we're going to start with number 10, or work upwards. Uh, so number 10 is project structure. So how, how should I structure my AngularJS project? And I think this is probably one of the first concerns that, that we had at New Desert, but I think one of the first things that, that developers uh, think about is, okay, you, you get the sample, you understand how the sample works, and then you start building out some controllers and some views in your model, and you end up thinking, okay, well, am I putting these in the right folder structure, and should it be this, should it be this? And ultimately, when it comes to structure, we, we kind of, it, it's almost like there's kind of three choices. Uh, number one, you can roll your own. So I could just say, okay, I'm just gonna put them in any folder. Uh, number two, um, there's something that you may have seen called the Angular C. Um, if you've not, it's uh, one of the uh, Google projects from the, uh, from the Angular team. And it's kind of like the, the, the canonical Angular app. Um, but one of the one of the nice things is um, they, uh, uh, they they kind of set up a, a, a kind of structure for you, which is a, which is kind of nice. And then thirdly is something called the the Yoman Angular Generator. So maybe uh, maybe show of hands who knows what Yoman is. Okay, so uh, a few people. Um, so Yoman is a set of tools uh, that really really make doing stuff in JavaScript a, a lot nicer. So you can find it by going to yoman.io. And there are uh, three tools today. Assuming I've got network, there we go. And there's uh, three tools in the uh, tool set. Uh, one is called Yo. Uh, Yo is a scaffolding tool for JavaScript. So it will build up a uh, project structure and a, a bunch of scaffold. Uh, the second is a tool called Grunt. Uh, Grunt is a build tool for JavaScript. So if you want to do a lot of uh, build automation, you want to run your tests um, in an automated fashion, uh, you want to do things like minification on the fly as part of your build, that's, that's what Grunt is for. And then Bower, um, which we'll be showing shortly, is a uh, dependency management tool for JavaScript. So instead of doing source script equals blur, um, Bower actually, uh, Bower actually manages, uh, manages, that, manages that for you. So Yeoman is this collection of three, and, and Yo has a scaffold for, for Angular. So what we can do is we can uh, go into a directory there, here. Uh, is this font okay for everyone? Larger, smaller, little larger. Uh, Better. I'll try and try and move this up. Um, so the way Yo works is is uh, pretty pretty uh, cool. We're in a uh, temporary director here. So I just type in Yo, um, install Angular. And uh, I need to the Angular. Yo, Angular. And uh, what it's going to do is it's going to run a Yeoman script. I get a strange piece of ASCII art, uh, and then it's going to ask me some questions about my project. Um, do I want a, a SAS, which is a CSS compiler? Sure. Do I want to include Bootstrap? Sure. Uh, sure. I'm not going to use this anyway. And then I can go through and also select uh, some of the Angular dependencies. So if you've used Angular, there's kind of a, there's a main Angular.js that you need, and then there's other add-on.js or JavaScript files that you can use. Uh, so resources for making network connections outside of HTTP, or outside of .http, which is the package. And um, cookies you're going to need if you're going to do anything with Angular and cookies. Uh, sanitize I've not used before, so I don't know. And then root is doing a root. Uh, so let's say we want all of that. What it's now going to do is it's going to pull down, um, go to um, npm, which is the node uh, package manager. It's going to pull down all of the dependencies that I need uh, for my Angular project. And uh, we could wait for 10 minutes for this to complete, or I could show you one that I did earlier. You always get stuck in the end? Oh, okay. Um, there is a couple of dependencies, um, weirdness dependencies with Karma. I think Yo installs Karma by default, so I would suggest completely uninstalling Karma if you haven't tried it already. To an npm uninstall of Karma and then you run the Yo script, and I think that will that will probably help. Um, so what we end up with is uh, we will shortly is a structure that looks like the following, and we're not going to look at any code. We're just going to look at the uh, the other bit on the side here. Um, so what it does, it uh, puts an app there. This is our uh, actual uh, application. Um, and then you 
pulls in uh, other things that we need. It puts everything under scripts, and then it puts uh, obviously a folder for controllers and, and uh, so forth. And what it does, and, and I think where a lot of developers go, is they, they break out the controllers and the services and the directives um, fairly cleanly, um, which, which is one way of doing it. So I guess the, the, the reason for showing this is just say it's, it's, it's I think, a, a fairly well-recognized pattern. And if you go down that, I, go down this route, I think it's, it's, uh, it's going to be helpful. So one of the things that we've also found, um, just to of that, the, uh, the tip-on structure, is uh, you, you find you use Yeoman and you, uh, you kind of put the structure together and you become very functional. So it's like, okay, well, here are my controllers, here are my services, here are my directives. And that's good, and it's, it's I think, a valid pattern. But some of the larger projects that we've done at Udesic, we've actually flipped a bit recently. And we said, what, what we were finding is that we wanted to add a piece of functionality to something, and we'd have to edit the controller, and then we'd have to edit the service, and then we create some new directives, and we were constantly flipping between these structures. So what we ended up doing for some of the larger projects is actually flipping it to a much more kind of functional model, where we'd say, look, this is a function, let's just call it to do, and here's a controller, here's a service, and then here's a set of directives. So just kind of kind of organizing the structure of the project so it's much more reflective of, of what what the actual behavior is of the project um, versus uh, versus those those kind of uh, those kind of control reserves. So one of the things that with moving on from structures is minification. So obviously minification is important, especially when you're pushing stuff out to production. And I think a lot of new developers or a lot of developers that are new with Angular JS ask the question, well, or should I minify my project? And one of the things about that makes Angular so unique is it's got a very, very flexible way. It's almost like dependency injection for JavaScript, a very flexible way of injecting things into your program. So it's like, hey, I need a, I have a module and I have three controllers, right, a new service. And as Angular starts, it's gonna build and package all of these things on the fly, which is great. However, when you try to minify things, obviously one of the things that minification does is it takes big, big names and makes them like X. So when you have a big controller name and, and you're using uh, a dependency injection, well, you've got a big controller name that goes to X, and then suddenly you've got something that was expecting big controller name and it, it's no longer available. So typically if you try to manually minify a, an Angular JS project, it's it's not going to work. And uh, I don't know whether anyone's tried that, but, uh, but with, with less than stellar results. So I think the question we need to ask is, well, do we really need to minify? And uh, I think one of the things is AngularJS, a lot of the things or everything that you'll find included from the AngularJS project is already compiled JavaScript. It's, it's as small as it's going to get. So you're, you're not going to be able to squeeze. Google have done a pretty good uh, for other JavaScript frameworks. So I mean, maybe just for those that haven't seen a directive, we just uh, just show you what one of these things looks like. So I'm going to open my uh, one of my projects here, and so I'm going to just kind of really sample projects. As I as I mentioned, I've kind of extended the to do project here, and um, it's really kind of unexciting. You've probably seen this if you've uh, if you've uh, used Angular before. So uh, I have a new to do item. So I know. And then I add it, and I can check things off there, and it's it's kind of kind of fairly simple. Um, so uh, so one of the things uh, one of the things that uh, we can show in here is is how directives work. So this this list this unordered list here has obviously a checkbox and then some uh, some text and a couple of other things. Um, well, what you can do with uh, with Angular is you can create a, a, a template. Um, and you can say, okay, for each of those lines, uh, this, is, uh, this is what that looks like. And then in your main index.html, you can just refer to that as a uh, to-do item, or whatever this thing's called. And the way this works is you set up a directive called a to-do item, and uh, we'll come back to the service later. And all it does is it pulls in that particular template. So the, the goal is it makes it 
really easy to make or to put together very declarative HTML. So instead of, and it's for the to-do sample, it's, it's, not really, it's not really an amazing thing, but once you get into some really, really complex grids and tables, the ability just to take out certainly many of those re repetitive rows or repetitive elements and create unique um, uh, custom directives is, is actually really, uh, really powerful. Um, so, so coming back to the, uh, to the slide here, so I think the, the, the goal, or at least the recommendation, is, is uh, to, to use more directives than you probably are today. I think one of, one of the things that we've learned in projects is we, we kind of knew what directives were, and then we kind of forget about them, and then we, we kind of do all this stuff, and then we, ended up, we end up kind of going back and saying, oh, well, that address field or that, uh, that list of states we could do as a directive field. Or you end up kind of retrofitting um, as, it, uh, as it kind of goes back. Um, so I think if you're, if you're new to Angular, or if you're, you're just getting up to speed, add this in the back of your minds. Look for, look for opportunities to use directives because, because they will, will become your friend. And tip number seven out of the 10 is around page loading. Um, and uh, this is actually one that came from a, a recent Google meetup, but it, we, we saw this a lot in some of our early projects, so I, I wanted to in, include it in the list. And the way Angular works um, is very similar to the way that a lot of other JavaScript frameworks work, where you use like a handlebars approach. So anything, I'll probably show you an example of this in my code. So here, for example, I've got a, a span here, and I'm saying uh, I've got a function called remaining, and then I've got, say, a, a length here. And you can kind of see that the variables are with these kind of handlebars. So, so fairly, fairly uh, sim simple stuff. Now, one of the things, if you're, if you're loading a lot of, uh, of the JavaScript asynchronously, one of the things that you notice with Angular is you kind of get this flash of stuff that comes up um, as the page is loading. So what will happen is it will load the HTML first, which has all of these handlebars in it, and then it, if you're asynchronously loading everything else, but it takes a while before that thing gets populated. And for the user, it's, it's not a major thing, but it's, it's kind of distracting. It's kind of weird. So one of the things really nice, nice and in fact, there's a couple of, uh, that we picked up on recently. Uh, one is a directive called ng-cloak. So if I was to do this, if I wanted to hide this, I would go back to my... Uh, uh, my span here, and I would just put ng cloak in here. And what it would do is it would hide that element until all of the Angular dependencies are loaded. So it means that you end up, you, the user doesn't see anything, and then once everything's loaded, then that span, uh, span that actually activates. And all it's doing is just setting a, a CSS uh, display between hidden and block. And then the other thing you can do is to use uh, ng bind. So there's, there's two ways of binding, uh, binding data to HTML. The first is to use those kind of squiggly handlebars. And then the second is to put an ng bind on, a, uh, on an element. So for example, um, if I didn't want to do this, let's say I, I replace this span, I could say ng bind with something that I had declared in my scope, and, uh, and that, that wouldn't be displayed until Angular loaded. So it's, it's a pretty minor point, but it's, it's one of those ones that as your Angular project gets bigger, um, it, it becomes, uh, it becomes a, a, nice, uh, a nice to have. Now I'll share the slides at the end in case you don't want to write down that, that URL. Um, there's a bunch of AngularJS uh, content out there, especially from Google. Probably one of the best uh, sessions, especially if you're getting new or you are new to Angular, is uh, this one, and it's, uh, it was uh, a Mountain View meetup, and just goes through actually quite a lot of these uh, these uh, these small uh, things like page loading, um, so you can you can optimize your app. And again, I'll share it at the end so you, you don't have to write down that horrible thing. Uh, number six, how many people are developing for Windows or on Windows? Windows machines, Macs. Uh, Linux, uh, and then who's targeting uh, all every browser? Who's uh, who's looking at Chrome and IE and Firefox and everything that people can? Okay, so good. So one of the things, obviously, is Internet Explorer. 
And uh, I think it's, it's really important. A lot, of the, a lot of the things in Angular do some pretty, pretty wonderful stuff with the DOM underneath. And it's so wonderful that sometimes IE doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what's, what's this look like? So if you're developing for IE, um, especially if you're developing for IE 8 or need to support IE 8 or lower, and this is definitely a document that you need to read. Um, this is just the, uh, the IE compatibility document on the uh, AngularJS site. Um, but I'm going to paraphrase it for you now, so uh, I'll kind of cover. This is, uh, this is what's uh, going on. So um, Angular is currently on uh, version 1.2, 1.2 point. Um, as of Angular 1.3, which is currently in beta, um, Internet 8, or support for Internet 8, and Internet Explorer 8, um, will no longer be supported. So they've, they've just reached a point where supporting IE 8 is, uh, is, is, uh, is not going to happen. Um, of course, IE 9 and above, um, I think, uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll still have a level of support. Um, now, if you don't have the option of moving to IE 9 or above, there are a few uh, things in the uh, in the document um, that you can uh, you can uh, kind of go through and make sure that, uh, that you're supporting. I think the key one to understand is um, IE eight and below doesn't like any custom directives. So if you remember that to do item here, if I were to launch this in IE eight, uh, to be honest, I don't know what it would do, <laughs> uh, but it, it wouldn't work. Um, so. The way that you do this is you actually prepend this with something like a div, or if it was a different element, like book D or H1 or whatever. But by doing by doing that, um, it will still Angular will still work, um, but IE8 won't uh, won't uh, won't kind of bump on you. So uh, again, a, a quick trip, uh, quick trip, but uh, but the one that's that's really important. And then finally, and in fact, we've got a session after this on. Uh, testing JavaScript, in case you're interested. Um, is it to do with I'm sorry? Is it to do with My session upwards? The next one. Oh, um, no. Unless, uh, unless someone else is uh, speaking. I won't be speaking about Jenkins. No, I'm, uh, so the next session is testing web applications using JavaScript. So, okay, I won't. I, I won't. I won't deviate, but. Uh, so one of, one of the facets of that is making sure that if you build a website, you can test it using Chrome and then Firefox, but also IE as well. Um, so number five out of the ten is probably the, the one that's going to strike home more, is, is around development environment. So okay, I'm a new Angular developer, or I want to get up to speed really quickly, what, what tool should I be using? Um, so Angular is actually fairly well supported in a lot of IDEs today. Um, I'm a big fan of WebStorm, and great to see JetBrains here, although I'm not using it for this demo. Um, and uh, WebStorm 8, in fact WebStorm since some time has had some support with, uh, with Angular. And as of 8, um, they've added uh, actually quite a bit of support. So if you're doing things like directives, or the intelligence actually around Angular is, is actually pretty, pretty strong. Um, so, so thoroughly recommend that. Um, if you're using uh, Sublime, uh, then uh, there's a package of uh, Angular snippets um, that you can get. So uh, if you're kind of going to Sublime, you can install a package. We'll download the uh, repositories here. And then there's a bunch of uh, Angular JS things. Uh, one that does code completion, and then one that does snippets, and then one that does uh, copy script. Um, so uh, if you're a, a Sublime, uh, User, that's, uh, that's really good. And then if you're not using an Angular supported IDE, there's still a few things that you can do um, to, to, to make things uh, work as they should. Uh, so for example, one of the, if you open this in a regular HTML element, uh, sorry, in a regular HTML editor, it would of course complain about this element. It's like, I have no idea what a, what a to-do item is. So the way we can get around this is uh, we can actually prepend data to it, and it will actually tell the ID. So most IDEs um, will actually recognize anything with data star, and they, they won't actually uh, flag it. So it's just a nice way of, and, and Angular, of course, will still work with this, just a nice way of, of making the IDE, uh, just preventing it from throwing up a bunch of, a bunch of warnings.
Um, oh yeah, the other thing uh, that's, that's kind of important is to install Angular through Bower. So I, uh, I mentioned uh, this thing called Bower. And let me show you at the, uh, the top of my Angular uh, page here. So the way, the way you normally do this, you probably do it in two ways. You either download the, the, uh, the Angular zip file, and then you put it locally, or you would go to their CDN, you'd say http api.google.com, whack angular, whack angular. Um, and and both, both are okay, but both are very static. They, they, don't, they don't keep, or they don't get uh, up to date. So one of the nice things is, is this thing called Bower. So Bower is a, a command line utility, and uh, we saw it from... Uh, Can you suggest something which is uh, providing more uh, question is, can I yeah, suggest something that's more intelligence on Visual Studio? Um, I can't, unfortunately, because I'm not a Mac. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, maybe drop me a line. And uh, we, we, of course, have a bunch of people that use Angular on VS. And I can, uh, I can probably get you that answer. It's a good, good question. Um, so one of the nice things uh, about Bower is it's uh, just a command line utility. You run it in your, uh, uh, in your uh, uh, kind of a kind of a project directory here. And um, I can do uh, like a search for different things. So I can do a search for Angular. It'll actually go out to the, uh, the Bower repository and find me everything that, uh, that matches Angular. I've got a bunch of, uh, bunch of stuff here. And I'm trying to think of one that's not going to break my demo. Uh, Angular gun. I don't know what that is. All right. So let's, let's install that. So uh, so we would do bar install Angular dash gun. And what it's going to do is it's going to pull everything down into this bar components uh, library. So we'll see this uh, updating very shortly. Um, and then all we need to do is we in our script we just need to reference the bar components. Uh, directory. So under here, I've already installed Angular, and here's the uh, the latest version of Angular. And this this kind of looks interesting, I guess. But its real power is when you uh, go to update. So what I can do uh, at any point in time, I'm not going to do it in fear of breaking this demo, is I can actually run a Bower update. And what it's going to do is going to go through all of my components and fetch down the latest version. Um, so it's just a, a nice way of doing dependency management. And certainly if you're playing around with Angular um, and other frameworks like Bootstrap and, and others, just a great way of, of getting, uh, getting that installed really quickly. Logging. Logging is, is always fun. So let's, let's go back to the, uh, the source here. And let's go into one of my control groups. All right, I'm going to uh, get some truth out of you guys. Um, when you're debugging an app, when you're logging an app, who does this? Right, a minute. Oh, you used to do it. Okay, who, who has graduated and does this? Okay, so we've got some console logins as well. And you know what, this isn't bad. I mean, so I'm gonna, I'll show you what this does. When we, when we run it, we get the I am here down here. But it's, it's not great either, because you scatter a lot of console.logs in, uh, in your file, and it's, it's just kind of messy. Um, so one of the nice things about Angular is they do support log for log for logging, but they've got this. And this is something that you can inject into, into any control or any service. And it actually works pretty similar to, uh, to console.log. So we can just do dollar log. And it's really not going to change anything. But it does one thing that's really important, and we'll come on to this in, in another tip. It actually observes the scope, scope life cycle correctly. So one of the things with Angular is when you do things in Angular, it has this concept of scope underneath. And Angular is responsible for keeping all of this scope in, in check. So when you add something to a collection, it will identify observers and do all kinds of magic under the scenes. And what happens if you start using things that are not scope aware is you can get kind of weird results. So uh, things like timeout, things like console.log. So you always encourage in terms of using the official the official kind of parts of the framework. Now what's also nice about this is dollar log can be extended. 
So in the sample code, which I will give you at the end, um, I've actually uh, written a quick extension algorithm. And um, in fact, I'll just, just show you what this does, and then we can, we can cover it. So I'm going to create a, a new logger. And this, I'm going to say dot log dot get instance, and this is called to do control. And then I'm going to say logger dot log. Um, I am in. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do exactly the same, but I'm going to go into a service that I have here and create another instance of the logger. But this time I'm going to do it in service. Right. So. So all I've done is just put some, some very specific logging that references uh, a, an instance that's referenced to the class. So when I rerun this, let me show you what it does. There we go. Um, it actually, uh, so it's a, kind of a quick extension, and what it does is it writes the uh, data and time in milliseconds, which is kind of handy for performance reasons, and then it writes the name of the instance and then the, the message that, uh, that I uh, put out. This is really nice when you're debugging a lot of controllers and services, because as, you, as you're kind of weaving through all of this stuff, you can kind of see, okay, I went from this service to this controller, back to this service, and, and so forth. Just makes debugging a, uh, a lot easier. Uh, so again, um, that was fairly simple to do uh, in, uh, in here. Uh, all we do is we uh, uh, create a, uh, a new version of uh, the log, and then we're just adding a, uh, a date and then just some context and whatever you, you uh, or whatever the, uh, the, the uh, is passed as, as the argument. And then again, I'll, I'll point you to the, uh, to the code later. Uh, later. Yeah, so dot log is a, uh, a dollar log is a service that you can, uh, uh, you can just inject into anything. So if you create a controller, uh, just, uh, I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, so the dollar symbol is um, kind of like a, almost like a reserved symbol in, in Angular. It it's essentially uh, represents an object or an Angular thing, I guess. Um, so whenever you see things like dollar scope, dollar log, dollar timeout, they're all either extensions or services um, that, are, that are part of Angular. It's kind of like a, uh, yeah, it's like a convention thing. Um, similar to how jQuery uses dollar dots and dollar open credit parentheses, very, very simple. Yeah, so if you just did scope, it would, scope would have to, have to come from somewhere. Um, so for example, my to-do service here, um, I, I have uh, in my, uh, where is it, my app here. Uh, so essentially we've got, so we've got the app here, and then we, uh, in the index here, we load a bunch of things. So I'm loading all of my services, all of my directives. And then the service itself kind of registers itself. So it says, OK, I'm going to register a to-do service using this, uh, uh, this uh, function here. And then what it means is I can just pass it to other controllers. So again, kind of coming back to this, think of it like if anyone's done dependency injection in C Sharp or Java, uh, very, very similar, but, but kind of kind of modified to do it in JavaScript. No, it would fail because there's nothing called scope. That would that would just die. And then, of course, if I were to reference scope here on its own, then if a local variable was called scope, it would work. But otherwise, it's it would be Um So uh, debugging, we we kind of showed a bit of this. And one of the really nice things that we found um, is uh, this thing called Batarang, we just uh, show. So if, you, uh, if you're a Chrome user um, and uh, you do a search on the web store for uh, um, AngularJS Batarang, or probably just AngularJS, you will come up with this extension, which is, which is really nice. What it does is it inserts a new uh, tab on my debug here called AngularJS. And uh, we will enable this for the demo. And what it does, um, it allows me to uh, do essentially three things um, in, uh, in my app, Angular application. This is kind of at the bottom of the screen, so I apologize. Uh, the first of all, it allows me to investigate my scope on the fly, which is really, really nice. So I can go into the scope, and I can actually look at what that scope contains. Um, so it's almost like it's 
Scope is like this, this kind of code behind kind of variable thing for those that, that don't know. And uh, this, uh, this is, is just a really nice tool for kind of going under the covers and seeing what Angular is doing. It also does a really, really nice uh, performance uh, diagnostics. And one of the most useful things that we've found is, um, let's see if I can scroll this up. It, it will actually tell you the, uh, the expressions that are using the most CPU time. So this is a fairly simple app, but it's already said that the expression that you're doing here is basically using 55% of the page at a time, taking a fraction of a second, but that's, that's, that's kind, of, kind of important. And as you get onto to bigger and better uh, Angular apps, this is, this is a great tool just for saying, okay, my, my page is loading in a second, but, but where is that going? Uh, and then the third uh, tool is around dependencies. And this is a bit of a funky graph. Um, it's a funky graph because I've imported a bunch of UI that I'll be showing you in a minute. Um, but what it shows is all of the dependencies within Angular. So services and controllers, services and other services, things like logging and other Angular dependencies. And it gives you this kind of nice graph um, where you can just say, okay, well, I've got this service called to-do service. What is, what is this thing relying on? And kind of gives you the, the, the paths, um, which, which can be nice, as well as looking for it. Uh, and then one of the final things is, uh, is kind of really cool. Um, let's see if I can do this here. Uh, you can actually uh, kind of uh, dynamically uh, investigate parts of the apps. So I can say, okay, show me uh, all of the thing that is considered the scope. And it will actually put uh, red rectangles around it. Uh, show me the bindings that I've got. And it will kind of, uh, kind of bring those out. Um, and then if you're running multiple apps, um, you can kind of kind of uh, break that out as well, but kind of nice just for, for later showing that page out. So if you haven't seen it before, um, Batarang is, uh, is definitely a tool that uh, I would, uh, would recommend. Um, and then one of the other things that's, that's really nice, I don't know how many people do a lot of debugging. Um, so let's say we wanted to debug, debug this. Um, let's say, uh, let's go into the code and break it. Uh, into index. Uh, or into my controller maybe, and I don't know. Let's uh, let's say we wanted to debug the the, uh, the add uh, function here. So when I when I click on the add button, well, the way that you typically do this today um, is you probably go to sources and then you dig in here, then you'd have to find controllers and to do controller, and then you have to set a breakpoint and that kind of thing. And and that's fine. But one of the nice things that was, was actually new to us recently, is you can actually just do this. This is not an Angular thing, by the way. But you can just put uh, a debugger in here and uh, reload the page. Let's pull that down. And when you uh, actually uh, reach one of those debugger statements, it will actually debug for you. Um, so uh, if you don't know that, uh, that's, uh, that's also a nice one. And this works really uh, really well in conjunction with um, uh, with uh, the Batrang uh, kind, of, uh, uh, kind of function as well, because what you'll do is you'll get this breakpoint, and then you'll actually be able to dig into the scope um, using the uh, the, uh, the panel to the right here. So, so, so the debugger is JavaScript functionality, um, but one of the nice things with Batarang is that you get this additional panel um, that shows you the uh, the scope call stack. So I was just mixing and matching just to uh, to make sure that uh, that people knew you could do that. So the debugger statement doesn't work if we don't have Batarang. I'm sorry. Oh, debugger will work. Yeah, debugger is just a regular JavaScript for it's probably browser based, but uh, but yeah, you can put that in in any uh, any JavaScript app. Um, Angular supported frameworks. So number four. So how do you deal with non-Angular stuff? Um, and and this is this is kind of one of these interesting things as we were as we were learning more about Angular, we we kind of found that Angular wants to do kind of everything. Wants to do routing, um, wants to do some of the uh, uh, some of the, uh, the, uh, the kind of scope stuff, and then we we want to take a framework like Bootstrap or jQuery and say, well, well how do we how do we how do we do this? Um, so so I want to include some some tips for doing this. Um, so Bootstrap, uh, you can just pull in Bootstrap and you can just use it normally, and you can uh, that will that will work up to a point. Um, however, there is a project called uh, UI Bootstrap, um, which is actually written by the AngularJS 
theme. And it's kind of a version of Bootstrap with a lot of Angular directives in it. So uh, let me pull up the, uh, uh, the Angular UI. There we go. Um, so UI Bootstrap, um, you essentially go to there, uh, you download it, or more preferably, you install it using Bower. And what it does is it gives you uh, a set of directives that you can you can just place uh, place in your code. So let me maybe show you an example of this. Um, I'll go to my uh, my index here and um, just show you where this is on the page. So let's let's say we wanted to put a a, a progress bar underneath it. So show me how many how many of the tasks have been completed. Uh, so what we could do is we could just use one of the um, the uh, Angular UI directives called a progress bar. I can spell. And then we can say the value is um, I think it works on a percentage value. So we will look at the remaining tasks. Uh, divided by to do stop length. So one by two times. Okay, we'll give that a go. So this is really nice because what it allows me to do is have very very angular like um, kind of a, kind of a directives here. But then within the value here, it's actually just letting me call straight into the scope. So if I've got a function called remaining, it just calls it. If I've got things like to-dos, it will just take the to-dos out. And uh, hopefully if this works. Oh, there we go. Uh, we've got, so, so we're kind of 50% complete. And then we're 100% complete. And now uh, we do a new task. We're kind of, kind of relatively easy to, to kind of get working. So, so just a fairly quick example, but one that takes, say, something like Bootstrap and, and just makes it kind of Angular And the other element is, is jQuery. So I think one of the things that we, we found when we were first doing uh, Angular is we, we come from a jQuery background. So every time we could, we were like, oh, let's do a dollar selector text, or just we kind of ended up de defaulting to jQuery. And over, to, over time, we actually found that A, it was bad, and we shouldn't be doing that. Um, but also within Angular, there is a, a lightweight version of jQuery uh, called uh, JQ Lite. So uh, my, my recommendation would be try and try and use or try and depend on as much stuff within J, JQ Lite as possible. It does HTML, it does text, it does val, it does a lot of those those kind of regular jQuery things that you you often use. But it does it in a way that that works well with Angular. It doesn't kind of kind of trans over Angular. The, the problem with Angular is a lot of these frameworks. Have the have a risk. You run the risk once your scope is destroyed, the app doesn't work anymore. So it's you, you really really need to make sure that Angular is, is kind of in control. And then of course, I mean again, if you are doing things like you're going into the uh, the uh, uh, the DOM and then you're setting things or hiding things, you should ask yourself, well, can this be done using a directive instead? Because that's that's much more Angular uh, Angular X. Um, and then just uh, just final things, uh, we touched on some of these earlier. Um, there's a bunch of uh, extension methods that Angular provides. So you want to do uh, JSON, um, uh, from JSON and to JSON. Um, J Angular also provides a uh, version of set timeout. So don't use set timeout with Angular because uh, you'll run into, uh, run into issues with uh, scope. Uh, we covered log. Um, there is a dollar window instead of window, which will give you an Angular one. A uh, dollar Q, uh, so Q, or this particular dollar Q is an implementation of a uh, JavaScript promise library. So if you're using separate promise libraries, you could probably find that you'll find most of it in uh, dollar Q. And then dollar document is, um, is for uh, just navigating the, the DOM. Um, they also have, uh, I think, one of the things that you may have seen in the, uh, the uh, console here. Right, what's that? Um, date formatting as well, so there's this thing called dollar filter, which will apply a fairly a generic filter on pretty much any piece of uh, content, and I've just used it here to format the date correctly. So you didn't need to pull in 
any any third party date libraries which themselves can, can be a bit of a nightmare. I'm sorry? Yeah, you can use pipe if you're doing like an ng repeat uh, with uh, with a filter. So this particular one, I'm, I'm just filtering um, on a uh, single element. But you're right, if you were to do an ng repeat, then you would do for items and items, pipe, and then the filter that you wanted to apply. Yeah, this one actually comes packaged in, uh, with Angular. So, uh, but you could create your own um, if you wanted to do something else with dates or, or anything else. Uh, three left. Separation of concerns. Uh, I think it's probably uh, probably nearing the top. So, how do you might make the right choices? This is a, uh, I think, a fairly uh, a fairly short one, but a, but a really interesting one. We kind of have three golden rules in projects that we do. Uh, number one, controllers should never refer to any DOM elements. If you're finding that in your controller you're going into the DOM and you're setting things, it will work even if you use the Angular things. But it's it's not it's not the right way to do it. It really doesn't. You're binding your controller to a particular view, and that's that's actually actually a bad thing. And that's that's generic MVC framework. That's that's not specific to Angular. Uh, controllers should number two here. Controllers should call services versus holding too much business logic. So this was a bit difficult to show with a to do app, but you've kind of got a to do controller here, and that to do controller is really should be calling a service. So in your, in your real world application, you want the controller to be as, as kind of efficient as possible, and then you want your data to be stored in services, or at least provided to you by services. And those services could then fetch data from, from elsewhere. But, but using that model, is, it really gives you a, a kind of clean separation of concerns. And then number three, if you're ever asking yourself the question, well, how do I pass stuff between controllers? It, it probably means that you're doing things wrong. Uh, it's one of those kind of gotcha moments where it's like, okay, it's, remember the angular graph, you're, you're probably somewhere down the bottom. So. Hmm. Now, there are ways to do it. There's like a bit, there's um, a broadcast, you could uh, pass things through roots code. But it, I don't know, it doesn't, it's still for me, maybe it's just a neat thing. Um, it's it, well, it depends what you determine is correct. It, it's the way that will work, but I, I like to think keep things a little more a uh, little more uh, isolated. So, an example. Uh, um, so we root scope in fact. Okay, go into scope in a minute. Uh, we do use root scope a bit, but we'll do broadcasts for things coming off of web sockets, which is pretty much the only way of doing it. But I don't know. I would never use that to to pass stuff to a uh, to another controller. Um, and then controller inheritance, uh, this is a little on the advanced side, but it is possible to use something called Angular Extend, which is very similar to, um, say, Underscore Extend, where you can take a class in JavaScript and you can, you can make a base class and, and have some inheritance out of it. Uh, so two left and about 10 minutes, 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 minutes. so I'm going to have this. Uh, so scope is really important, um, fundamentally important to, to understand in Angular. And I think one of the, the classic examples is, is that scope is not your model. So scope should really be a binding or a glue between your controller and the model. It shouldn't be the model itself. And this is, this is kind of weird because a lot of the samples and a lot of the getting started things show the scope being the model. And it's like, oh, this is really easy. I just do just work with the model like this. And then you get so far that it, it becomes unusable. So just keep just keep that in mind, um, and then also a, a service in Angular is a singleton. So once you in, invoke a service, that that service will will live for the lifetime of the app. So it means that you can pass that service around any controller and, and not have to pay a penalty for the reinvoking. Um, and then just a couple of more things here. Uh, number one, avoid root scope. Um, you, you, there, there are times where you need to use it, but I think services provide a much more cleaner uh, separation. Um, and then there are, uh, are uh, cases of uh, doing scope, subscopes as well. So for example, <coughs> um, if you use the, uh, the bootstrap model, um, if you say do a, um, a dialog, a pop-up window, then what will happen is um, the, uh, the UI bootstrap will actually create you a new scope 
for that, that dialogue window, which actually can be, can be really useful because you might have a dialogue window with lots of fields in, uh, and then you, you can kind of separate or keep that, that scope separated. So one of the things I did want to touch on in the last 10 minutes is, is performance, because I think as you get more involved with Angular, um, this, this becomes a, a, real, a real thing. And Angular has a lot of magic in it, and you, you don't want to have to pay for that magic with performance. So ultimately, you are not in control when Angular does stuff. It, you may think you are, but, but really when Angular does stuff on the, on the scope, you probably don't know what's happening underneath. And a single change in scope that may be as simple as a key press can result in multiple function calls that you may not even think were, were actually happening. Um, so in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to this and I'm going to put some code up and we'll have a quick quiz. So let's say I've got a table and the table has some items and um, we've got uh, item in items here and we're printing the name, the description and then we're calling this function called get price. So if I have 250 items, how many times do get, does get price get called? 250. Okay, that's what you would think. Let me show you. Ah, yes. Indeed. He's seen this talk before. <laughs> All right, so let me, uh, let me show you. So I'm going to uh, put, uh, put some stuff here. And I'm going to go back into my template here. And what I'm going to do is, uh, so my template would show the to-do items. I'm going to call a method called get category. And all that's going to do is it's going to go to a service and it's going to return. Uh, do I, yeah, here we go. It's going to return a sample category. So it's just like a, a third. Imagine that this was a calculated field. And um, in my, uh, that's all I need. So I'm going to refresh this and go to the console. So here we go. We've, uh, we've got the sample category. So that's what was, was returned. And everything looks like it's working, look pretty good. Uh, however, we're also logging to the console. Every time get category function is called, we're logging it to the console. So let me show you what happens when I type some stuff here. So now I've had 76 calls to the get category function, but the page didn't get updated. And what's happening is, because that text box is bound to the scope, um, every time I do a key press, the scope gets updated. And Angular is like, well, okay, the scope is updated. Who cares that the scope is updated? And because we've got a table here, we've got an ng repeat that's bringing this category, it's like, oh, I care. So um, yeah, I'm going to call that service again. So it keeps doing it. And as you can imagine, this, this doesn't really matter much for my uh, my my sample app here, but imagine that was coming from a network and I was getting the categories for a network. Or imagine we had a, a thousand items in that list and it was doing it for every item. So really uh, really critical now because there is a way we can, we can overcome this. Let me go back to uh, my, uh, my code here. What we really want to do is avoid calling these functions as, as part of scope here. So I'm going to go into my controller and I'm going to see if I can do this in the time remaining. I'm, so I'm going to create what's called a, a watch collection. So instead of just calling functions randomly, I'm going to watch um, a collection, and I'm going to watch the to-dos. And uh, if the to-dos change, I'm going to call a function called new to-dos, and I'm going to iterate through those. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a category on them, um, and then I'm going to call the category. So what I'm doing is I'm every time the the, the actual to dos change, not the scope changes, I'm going to I'm going to do that. And I think I'm going to pass that. It's almost like pair programming. This it's like uh, anything I've done. I think that's going to work. And then all I need to do is go into my template, and instead of calling get category. Now I should be able to just do to do dot category. All right, so let's see whether this works. Nope. Uh, then fine. What did I do wrong? And you guys gonna help me out here? Uh, to do this. Uh, you to do this 
not explore. Am I? <laughs> oh, what you might need to do is correct from function need to do this. I'm passing that, that should be, take the zero, put the top and then, uh, I'm going to have a time. Uh, you're right, sorry, the, yes, well spotted, thank you, the pressure of having so many faces. Uh, so what we see is, is something slightly different this time. So what's happened is the page is loaded, and we've obviously to do this change. To do this. And uh, so what it's done is it's actually added the category as a property of each to do here. And hopefully when I type here, we don't have that uh, that, that, uh, that function because nothing's nothing's actually changed. It's not until I actually add a, a new task that it will actually rerun that. The, the watch will get invoked. So it's one of those subtle things, um, but hopefully brings together quite a few things where, where if you could imagine, you could you could go down the path pretty easily of writing a fairly complex Angular app, and we have, uh, only to discover that you, you kind of reached this cliff. And one of the interesting things about performance um, is typically most of the things can happen faster than the human eye can process. So even if the scope changes 20, 30 times, no one's really going to complain. But things start getting weird once, once you reach about 1,500. So if you have, I don't know, 500 items in the table, and each are calling uh, three different functions like we had, you're, you're going you're to notice, OK, well, every time I press a key in the edit box, it goes really slow. This is, this is kind of strange. And what happens is it also is exponential, so it kind of goes off a cliff. So suddenly it slows down and your, your user's like, hey, this is a bit slow. The next day, it stops working. It's, it's like, oh my god, this is terrible. So performance. Um, we covered that. And of course, watches and watch collections invoked in terms of the controllers are the way, way to do it. Oh, and I could have just looked at mine. Um, so the 10 again, just to wrap things up, uh, I'll, I'll leave that on the... Uh, uh, on the, the page here, but hopefully I mean, we've gone, covered quite a, quite a few in the hour here. We've gone through structure, uh, we've look, looked or spoken about minification, take a look at some directives and some page loading, um, talked about IE, messed around with the development environments, we looked at some non-angular stuff with Bootstrap, and then talked about separation of concerns, scope, and performance. And if there's anything else, I will leave my contact information here. Um, if you're interested in the code, it's on GitHub. Um, so github.com, whack Simon Guest, whack uh, Gibbs is where you'll find the code for all of my sessions. And then if you want the slides, if you go to slideshare.net forward slash Simon Guest, uh, you can get the slides as well. Uh, so with that, I maybe we'll do questions until I get completely end of time. I think, yeah, and two questions, unless there's any. Okay. When you are typing in the text box, is the entire scope of the application being separated or only that particular element scope or the scope of the text box? Good question. So when I was typing in that text box, um, anything that is bound to the scope, um, especially functions that are in an ng repeat, um, get, get called. So the, essentially the scope does get updated. And anything that's watching that scope um, will, will actually be notified. So, so even that uh, the, the, the table gets uh, rendered again and again. No, the table doesn't get rendered, but the scope gets updated underneath. So yeah, it's not flickering. Today. That's a good question. Uh, question over here. Uh, they say that we should not use the scope, uh, like uh, and we should not use the scope. Mm -hmm. Good question. So, so yeah, the, the common advice is avoid rote do scope. Um, I would look at putting things in services. So, service a service is a singleton. So, you could maybe it's authentication token. You can actually give that to a uh, an auth service, and it will hold that as a uh, as a global variable. So.
and then you can just call from that service with anyone. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're done. I'm getting a uh, call on. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Uh,